Hello, welcome to The Market Carver. I'm Adam Harder, Chief Investment Officer of Financial Enhancement Group. So thankful that you took a few minutes uh, of your time to give us uh, the opportunity to go over a few of the points we had in this week's investment allocation meeting. And this week, it is pretty dense. Uh, we've got a lot, of, a lot of topics we're going to uncover, but we'll try to go through as, as seamlessly as we can. You can see a large list there. Don't let it be intimidating because we're going to uh, unpack that and what it might mean to you. But first, we're going to start with investment factors. Uh, and mostly it's just to reorient, reorient you to the term. You hear the term sectors probably a whole lot, but behind the scenes, factors are at times equally as important or sometimes more than sectors. So what are factors? Uh, back in the 1960s, I know this is a little bit academic, but two researchers, Fama and French, uh, underwent a study to try and find factors uh, in the stock market that seem to work over time. And they divide them into several of these buckets. It's been a little bit expanded uh, since the 60s, 60s. But what's interesting is that uh, periodically they will update the study. They did so in the 90s. They did so uh, in the last decade. And they find that uh, there are five factors that tend to hold over time. So we keep in our back pocket uh, those factors and apply them uh, in a series of ways. So on the bottom here, you see some of the, those big ones from that Fama and French study. Values, size, momentum, volatility, quality, and dividend yield. Uh, those are the factors. They don't all work at the same time, but over a longer period of time, they have been found uh, to outperform. One of the strategies that we use, it's not in all portfolios because it's not uh, applicable or not appropriate for all strategies, uh, but it is uh, put together by Invesco, one of the bigger exchange-traded fund operations. But they invest in the factors, uh, but their spin on it is that the factors do different at different parts of the econ economic cycle and different parts of a market cycle. So they put those two things together. And you can see uh, those market and macro factors on the top, growth, inflation, financial conditions. Uh, they put those together and rotate, uh, as you can see here, between those different factors, between low volatility, size, value, momentum, and quality. So over time, those are the factors that rise to the top, uh, but they found a little bit incremental return when they can rotate based on the, the economic cycle. So behind the scenes, uh, factors equally important. So value is one of those that has been one of the main focuses of this year. You've heard us use that term a lot. Value has been absolutely beat to death in the prior decade uh, abnormally. Uh, so when you go back 60s, 70s, 80s, all those decades, value seemed to, to do well. This most recent one is where it fell short. So getting a lot of attention that is coming back into uh, success. So most importantly, I would say it's important to have diversification, uh, again, because they don't all perform at the same time. Cash on the sidelines. This is a topic that is talked way more in the financial media than we give it credence to. Cash has so many different purposes. I think it can be misleading at times. Uh, but this is important because corporate cash has continued to rise. Uh, and that's because a lot of the big companies have done well over the past year. Uh, the important implication here for, for me uh, may speak to inflation is that they have continued to accumulate this cash. So we knew that it, it grew uh, substantially over the last year. Think Apple and Amazon that did particularly well, those big companies at the top amassing uh, trillions of dollars collectively, but they have failed to deploy that. Uh, and so that has implications that uh, it is not circulating back throughout the economy. So in, in my mind, that is one of the things that has anchored our inflation expectations argument. Of course, there's things on the other side of, of the equation, but balancing that out uh, ultimately is if cash is, is being uh, created, if there's being a lot of money printed, doesn't mean a whole lot if it's not circulating a lot through the economy. And this is one place where it is, is getting trapped. doesn't mean that it'll stay there, uh, but to re-engineer the cycle, to get things restarted, it would be real nice to see companies actually invest back into plant, plant property and equipment, or at least in even a more sizable way, return that to shareholders. But it's not just public corporations. Private equity funds have also been able to amass a lot of cash. This has become real popular with pension funds and high net worth individuals who have accumulated a lot of cash. They are sending money to private equity firms who use their arsenal to go and buy companies uh, that are in, in, in the private sector or at times a big public company and take it private uh, could also be one of the ways that this is redeployed. But there is a lot of dry powder uh, and this could have have implications on smaller and mid-sized companies, which have really struggled in these past couple of quarters. Uh, but the money is flowing into these private equity funds faster than they can get it 
deployed. And, and here specifically to these funds, keep in mind, they are heavily incentivized to get that money to use. If they don't invest it, they'll be returning it to shareholders. If they do get it invested, they earn fees and perhaps profits off of that investment. So a strong incentive for that money or this dry powder to get to work. So one thing we have on the radar for, for smaller companies. Uh, turning our attention now to turnover long-term in the global top 10. So if you look at the S&P 500 right now, what you find is that Apple uh, for a number of years has been our largest company. But if you go back over time, you'll see that very simply things change. But we found this stat interesting in going through our research this past week is if you look through uh, the top 10 uh, of the tables, going back to 1970, uh, what we find is that uh, there is less than one in five chance of companies that finish in the top 10 of being there in the next decade. So pretty small sample size for you statisticians, but still noteworthy, especially as you look at the names and how that has changed over time. You see Apple has a long run as being the largest company, but you also find it fascinating that it wasn't all that long ago that General Electric, uh, which has really fallen in, in the tables and uh, become a much smaller company, but it wasn't all that long ago that they were the largest company in the S&P 500. And of course you see uh, oil periods there where Exxon or then later Exxon Mobil, uh, the largest company that they then falls. So uh, we go through periods of change, and the importance here is that we see companies that are dominating at the top, Apple, Amazon, uh, but we have to keep in mind that, that things do change, uh, technologies change, and this, these tables will change for companies at the top, and we're always on the lookout uh, for those companies that will wind up there in the future that aren't just there today. Turning our attention to technical charts. So we got a mixed bag here. Uh, as always, we give you an S&P 500, and it continues a very consistent uptrend. So that is the top panel, the S&P 500. Every time it comes down to its trend line, uh, that is the blue, relatively straight uh, line. Every time the S&P 500 pulls back to it, it is finding enough buyers to rally higher. However, we still see a mixed bag underneath there. We also want to look at the stocks in the S&P 500 uh, and measure the percentage of those that are making new highs, as the S&P 500 is, as well as the percentage of those that are making new lows. Pay in, in close attention to those stocks that are making new lows. So even though the S&P 500 is working higher, there is an ever higher percentage of those that are making new lows. So something to keep our eye on, that there is still uh, a large number of companies, something we've been saying for several weeks. Uh, low participation and an increasing number of stocks that are not in the winning table. Uh, the good news of this is that there is a slightly rising uh, trend of those making new highs as well. So uh, increasingly, it's a stock picker's market full of winners and losers and one that actually we're, we're, we're welcome uh, to be investing in. Credit spreads. We always have this. It's a piece of our risk barometer, but we have our eye on the ball whenever we see credit spreads rise higher. So what do I mean by credit spreads? Well, everything starts with the United States Treasury. To uh, any investor, the U.S. Treasury is going to be uh, the most riskless bond that you can purchase. Anything you'd purchase outside of that, whether it's a corporation uh, or an institution or an agency bond, uh, anything you'd go outside of the U.S. Treasury, you're taking more credit risk. There's an increased likelihood that that institution institution won't be able to fully repay you. So therefore, you should be earning a higher rate of interest. The difference between those two are credit spreads. Uh, when investors aren't concerned, that's really tight. You don't demand a whole lot of extra interest for lending to uh, less credit worthy institutions. When we see that begin to rise, that's when we say credit spreads are widening. That is when we begin to get concerned. We are nowhere near that yet. However, for the first time in several months, we are beginning to see that trend turn the other way. We are seeing at the leading edges a little bit of extra widening, we call it, in credit spread. So something, if it were to continue, filters through our risk barometer, filters through the way in which we manage money. And these are the sorts of things that get our eye early on in a financial cycle. So very well could be just uh, normal noise in the market as it ebbs and flows, just not a trend we want to see continue. Lastly, we're going to talk about margins. So we're now on the back side. Most of the S&P 500 has reported their earnings. That happens on a quarterly basis. Uh, the chart here is plotting the number of times uh, the words have been mentioned in their earnings reports about cost inflation. And we see that rising. We also see uh, an incredible surge in the words for labor shortage. Those two things go uh, hand in hand if you think about it. But both of those are problematic for corporate 
profit margins. If you see uh, increased cost inflation, you see increased labor costs. Both of those are costs to a corporate balance sheet or a corporate income statement uh, and filter through in a negative way to uh, profit margins. Uh, on the other hand, uh, analysts, S&P 500 analysts, continue to forecast an increase uh, in earnings expectations. And that's a good thing. Uh, however, when you plot that against times in which cost pressures have been uh, mentioned, you also see a, a historic high in the number of times those have been mentioned. So those two things don't go hand in hand. Is an early tell, it's something that has us at least moderately concerned, that those expectations for earnings are a bit too high. Uh, and the reason we have to be extra cautious about that is because the price investors are paying for those expected earnings is also high. Uh, so if there would be any material uh, hit to those earnings expectations, it could be, again, problematic. And furthermore, when we look in the past instances where that has happened, those are circled uh, on the yellow line. Other times when we've seen that, earnings uh, therefore stalled in forthcoming quarters. So something that we have our eye on in terms of the fundamental side of the market. Again, the technicals in the S&P 500 and a clear uptrend uh, fundamentals beginning to weaken a little bit, at least at the margins. Uh, that's the S&P 500, but we also have the world uh, to be concerned about. And you might have heard about Chinese tech stocks. Uh, which have been absolutely crushed here as of late. There's two things on this chart. You have the gold line, which is the Chinese A shares. These are more of your mainland, uh, typical Chinese companies that mostly only the Chinese uh, locals can invest in. Uh, this is a market that recently began opening in a small way to forward investors. I think it could be a really interesting uh, way of the future as it becomes a bigger and bigger piece of world indices. Uh, but then you have the green line, which are a lot of the ways Americans buy Chinese stocks. Uh, this is the NASDAQ Golden Dragon ADRs. So they're Chinese stocks that trade here in the United States, uh, and they are continuing to make new lows. The mainland Ch Chinese stocks are trying to find somewhat of a bottom, that gold line. Uh, but the uh, ADR market is continuing to find a bottom. This begs the question, when do they become a buy opportunity? Uh, they may very well be. This is a high-flying group that has uh, not had much of a, a correction to speak of uh, in the, the last several quarters. So this is certainly something that has uh, our attention and could potentially turn into an area. But again, extra caution is, is warranted because a lot of this is initiated by U.S. regulatory action and trying to uh, lock down on uh, foreign investment into Chinese equities. So once again, uh, you have plenty of opportunities to catch our radio show. Consider this, whether it's a live uh, opportunity on WIBC or on the several chances you have in a convenient form of a podcast. Whatever floats your boat, I hope you find one that works for you, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks again for giving us a few minutes of your time.